Welcome. Uh, I'm very happy to have you all here. Uh, when we open a new season, we present um, exhibitions that we hope will challenge you, and um, we're very honored to have um, Edgar's uh, first presentation in Detroit. Um, it's just this wonderful exhibition in our main gallery that I invite you to uh, visit um, after the talk if you haven't already. Um, and um, one of the things that's important in our public programming is also not only to contextualize the shows that we do, but um, one of the new things that we're doing is we're also inviting our artists to be able to uh, plan things in the program to allow us to uh, deal with other issues that are broader issues that they're interested in. And um, Edgar and Julian Myers have been involved in a, in a long conversation about um, Detroit and about sort of the, cu the cultural implications of particularly the moment of 1967. And uh, Julian is an art historian and uh, a writer, and Edgar is an artist who also works um, with community issues in, in California where he's based. And they have invited Cornelius Harris, the uh, unknown writer for underground resistance, to participate in this conversation. So um, I invite you to um, see the shows, Life Stories, which is a show where artists are exploring bi biographical issues and Edward's show in our main gallery. And we will also have a curator's talk on next Thursday at 6 p.m. should you want to know more about the shows. But I'll hand it over to them and thank you so much for coming. Great, thanks, Louise. Um, and thanks to everyone at MoCAD who's played a part, uh, Renee and Ben especially. Um, so I want to give a sense of what, uh, what we'll do today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit um, to get us started um, about the project um, that Edgar and I have been engaged in for the last five years or so, um, coming to Detroit several times during that, uh, during those years, um, and building a kind of uh, uh, a set of um, investigations and references um, and ideas around the subjects of history, um, space, um, music and culture. Um, today's talk um, is going to draw on those investigations and it's going to focus um, um, it's going to focus on our different ideas and perspectives. It's going to be an open conversation um, amongst us. Um, so I just want to give a little bit of introductory material in the last maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Um, so to give a sense of where this project began, I was a, a student in the history of art at UC Berkeley um, in the early 2000s. Um, and I was writing a dissertation on, it's titled No Places, which is on the, uh, the project of earthworks and the theories uh, of space that um, were being worked out in the 1960s. And one of those investigations was um, of a sculpture that happened here in Detroit um, in 1971. Um, called Dragged Mass Displacement. It took place on the lawn of the DIA um, in that moment. And, um, so I want to read just uh, the beginning of the chapter that I wrote on that sculpture, um, which is on the screen right now. Um, that'll give you a little bit of an idea of you know, what, what happened and what it was. Um, and we'll move from that description into talking much more freely about the sort of network of the constellation of ideas that uh, kind of grew out of this investigation over time. So Heiser, the artist Michael Heiser, installed dragged mass displacement on the north side of the, uh, the Detroit Institute of the Arts over the course of three days in March 1971. Um, How many of you guys are familiar with Michael Heiser's dragged mass displacement? A few of you, okay. I was just curious about it. Yeah, one of, one of the things. Prior experience. This is the first time we've talked about this in Detroit, and we've done this a number of times. So, you know, I, I, I sort of figured, like, as good as we do this conversation, um, that, you know, you guys bring that, you know, that home grown experience to the conversation as well. So, I, I just wanted to, to add before we start yeah. that I think if people have stuff that they want to add, to the, the topic as we go forth. I'm, I'm open to that. I don't know if Julian wants you to talk or not, but I'm okay. Um, <laughs> um, because I've heard counter stories from the ones that we that we know about drag mass. And 
maybe you might know some other myths or legends about it too. So, so So the idea for this work um, involved dragging an enormous 35-ton granite block, which was donated by uh, Rock of Ages Corporation um, across the Institute's north lawn until its weight began to dig inexorably into the ground, and in the artist's words, an impressive pile of dirt was dug up. The work was installed as part of a solo exhibition called Photographic and Actual Work, which was curated by Samuel Wagstaff, who was at the time the Institute's Curator of Contemporary Art. Uh, it was Michael Heiser's first solo exhibition in a major public institution. Um, and the indoor exhibition consisted of uh, a large-scale photographic installation um, of the artist's Munich Depression, titled Munich Rotary Interior which was commissioned especially for the Detroit show. Dragged Mass um, was to be the actual part of the exhibition's title. So it's photographic and actual work. Um, one photograph, which was published in Gregor Mueller's uh, book, The New Avant Card, that's a photograph by a photographer called Gianfranco Giorgioni, um, whose photographs of the earthworks are the uh, most compelling historical documents of that era. Um, shows a crowd of over 100 people watching the creation of the earthwork, including local high school and college students, parents and young children bundled up against the winter, which has, uh, it feels today. Um, and one spectator, if you look here, uh, one spectator has climbed up the boom of the, a nearby crane to get a look from above. Uh, the picture offers evidence of a congregation initially thrilled by the spectacle of the work's creation. As, however, as Dragged Mass took its final messy anti-form, and just to give you another image of what it looks like. Uh, as Dragged Mass took its final messy anti-form, confusion ensued. Um, after three days of labor, the sculpture was neither picturesque nor majestic. It didn't stand up as a conventional monument might. Um, it didn't even seem finished. To many it seemed accidental, random. Crude bulldozer tracks over a churned, destroyed lawn, mangled roots and steel cables emerging from a pile of dirt, and a huge half-buried rock. So, I'll give you a sense. Yeah, I recently discovered some slides of this material, color slides, and so these are unseen uh, for today. There you go. Beautiful. So, in the longer version of this, uh, I elaborate on the public confusion and describe the struggles of the work within the Detroit Institute. Um, for my purposes today, I'll summarize them. Um, the work caused a lot of angst in the local press. Um, one headline read, Oops, Lawn Art is no breeze. Um, after the tractors left, the free press proclaimed, Whatever it is, it's finished. This, this was funny, but it had real effects within the DIA itself, which had harbored mixed feelings about Heiser's Earth Project from the start. Um, when Heiser offered to donate the finished work to the DIA, um, the institution refused his gift um, and ordered him to remove the work, which was contracted to be on the lawn for six months, um, after just one month, as soon as the exhibition inside ended. He was asked to do so at his own expense. On April 8th, Robert Skull, one of Heiser's most dedicated patrons sent a telegram canceling his scheduled lecture in protest of the DIA's decision. On April 25th, the same day that uh, photographic and actual work came down, the Arts Commission removed the block to a temporary storage facility and ordered Wagstaff to pay $10,000 out of his own pocket to resod the North Lawn. Um, the curator complied very bitterly. Um, and 
his, uh, his name is uh, listed as uh, one of the donors to the museum. This was his donation, $10,000 to reset the lawn that his project had destroyed. Um, later that year, after several failed attempts to contact Wagstaff or Heiser, they stopped picking up their phone. Um, the Arts Commission uh, finally ordered that the granite block be destroyed with dynamite. Um, one Arts Commission member, Ron McElvenny, was particularly aggrieved by what he called the tragedy on the lawn, um, and is said to have taken distinct pleasure in pushing the plunger to destroy the last remnant of dragged mass himself. He went so far as to give his anti-earthwork a clumsy, malicious title, which, he, which was the re-sculpturing of the Heiser earthwork, making it back into sculpture. Um, uh, Guggenheim curator was asked to write about uh, this show for arts, and uh, she had the very strange last word in this debate um, in an essay called Holes Without History, which was published in May of that year. Um, she described in that essay the works, and I'm quoting her now, its terrible aggression, its abandonment of order for chaos. She wrote, um, and I'm quoting her now, um, drag mass displacement is a rude disruption of its immediate surroundings. A large area of newly placed sod was ripped out for the work, causing a local riot. The work almost didn't get built because of the furor over its location. Having flown out especially to see the work, I was unnerved to hear a woman's screams in the background. A mugging was taking place in the museum parking lot in broad daylight. An elderly woman later sat in the museum delivery area bleeding from the assault. I heard about a letter to Heiser from a woman who saw in the piece a brutality that she compared to the brutality of suffering in Vietnam and her son's suffering in particular. And she ends by saying, this was the reality of Detroit, far from the peace of the desert, where Heiser had made many works before this. Okay, so this is a really strange piece of criticism. Um, and I, I want, I want in, uh, in various ways to uh, consider it, to figure out its res resonance, um, and to mark the ways that it was and wasn't an accurate account of the work. So, we have to think, I think, I believe, uh, about the work's particular anti-form. It's collapsing together of artistic regimes um, that Waldman describes as its abandonment of order for chaos. Um, and, you know, in, in this chapter, I do this by looking towards this drawing, uh, this drawing of the work, which I think about in terms of uh, its, the work's uh, conception as a kind of attack on the abstraction of the city, um, a, a, an attack on the, the, the space and the material of the city. And I think um, in this uh, study about the way that Heisler seems to misconstrue and miss things about Detroit in particular. Um, he totalizes his attack on the city system, what he calls, what he calls the absolute city system. Um, is that what so I think, I think about this, I consider this in terms of um, this drawing. Um, and ask what the drawing tells us about the actual iteration of dragged mass as it appeared in Detroit. Um, the work was imagined, by right, um, as an intervention in an abstract field. Um, the drawing also suggests that the earthwork concerned the resistance of that abstract field to including such an object, such a gesture, and that it entailed bringing the resistance of that field uh, into representation, making a resistance between the abstraction of space and the physicality of mass and gesture visible. It's a work that once cited meant to disrupt city space, to tear at its studied neutrality, to make a show of abrasion, of not fitting. As it's imagined in this drawing, dragged mass is this incommensurability between rough stone mass and pleasant lawn. In the drawing, this incommensurability is registered by the pressure of the graphite as it's raked across the paper. 
The earthwork, on the other hand, represented this friction. Represented this friction by the rough furrows created by the stone's drag. The bite of the caterpillar treads, the cables, the dirt, the rock, all take their place in this ensemble as indices of absence, traces of a traumatic event, now visible only through its terrible remainders. Indeed, some photographs of the work seem composed to insist on this aspect of the, the work's character. The city gives the illusion that the earth doesn't exist, uh, Robert Smithson wrote in 1968. Michael Heiser calls his earth projects the alternative to the absolute city system. And these, sen these sentences are brief but suggestive. They tell us that in the 1960s, Smithson and Heiser who were friends at the time of that statement, though that didn't last long. Um, they understood the city as the site of the production of an illusion, one that claims to be absolute and systematic. They imply, too, that Earth projects might somehow be the alternative to that illusion by insisting on the base materiality that the illusion of the city means to exclude. Kaiser's drawing makes clear that he means to force Earth back into the realm of representation in, opposite, in, in opposition to the city's illusion of totality by scoring its surface, by defacing it. His work believes absolutely in disfigurement's power to dispel illusion, and is relentless in its pursuit of means to do so. So drawing as dragging is powerful counter magic to the relation inherent to urbanism between ideal drawing and absolute space. And yet, Heiser's assumption of the absoluteness of the city or the abstraction of the lawn may have been one crucial misjudgment in Heiser's conception of the project. And I read this um, by way of uh, a kind of a disillusioned leftism um, that this kind of attack on the city might have been meant to enact. And I quote uh, the urban theorist Henri Lefebvre, um, who describes the stance of certain leftists in this era after, uh, in 1971, after what he calls the defeat of the urban guerrilla movement, uh, the, the defeat of urban guerrilla actions in the late 1960s. And here he's thinking of uh, many things. He's thinking of Watts, um, riots in Watts in Newark, um, in Paris in 1968, and in particular the riots of 1967 in Detroit. Um, he says, uh, he describes the stance of certain leftists after the defeat of the urban guerrilla actions of the late 1960s and the halting of what he describes as their reappropriation of space. He describes this as a, a despairing attitude. Um, and it's a despair, I think, that Heiser apparently shared um, and with dragged mass as the key piece of evidence. This despair, though, I think, opens Heiser to strong critique. It is argued, Lefebvre says, that only bulldozers or Molotov cocktails can change the dominant construction of space. The problem with this posture is that it minimizes the contradictions in society and space as they actually are. Although there are no good grounds for doing so, it attributes a hermetic or finished quality to the system. In the very process of heaping invective on the system, it comes, in a sense, under its spell and to su succeeds only by, by glorifying the system's power beyond all reasonable bounds. So, this phrase, only bulldozers and Molotov cocktails can change the dominant construction of space. It's not hard to imagine Kaiser saying something like that and believing it to his core. And yet, pitched so vehemently against the abstraction of the 20th century city, Heiser wasn't able to figure in dragged mass urban, urban modernity's confounding doubleness, the facts that its drive for constructive order and efficiency are bonded to its passion for uh, comminution, destruction. Um, modernity is the bulldozer, but it's also the wrecking ball. Five years earlier, if we imagine dragged mass as taking place in 1967, it might have served as a kind of rallying point but to the dispossessed of Detroit in 1971, his gesture seemed nihilistic or nonsensical. A 
hole without history in a city full of them, or just one more form of demolition. Lefebvre continues, schizophrenic leftism of this kind secretes its own unconscious contradictions. And so I wrote this as a, as a, uh, as a graduate student, um, both in the thrall of uh, the project of the social history of art and um, very critical of it, very critical of its, it, its use of history as a kind of backdrop or its automatic connections between um, politics and uh, artistic form. Um, and I was at the time thinking uh, also, I met uh, Edgar in 2004 as I was composing this chapter and began to think about ways that I could radicalize or rethink my own practice um, as a writer. Um, and coming into contact with uh, his production um, gave me a picture, an image of what, uh, what a different attitude to his history might look like. Um, and I engaged him at that point, um, kind of over drinks at a bar um, at very late at night, and I said, do you want to work on this with me? <laughs> do you want to? And, and what, what evolved out of that uh, conversation um, was a long-term collaboration. Um, the works that meant the most to me in that moment um, of Edgar's were was a body of work called Drawings of Removal. Um, and Edgar, maybe you are the person to say a bit more about this. Sure. Um, but first I want to say that I'm, I really love the, the reading that you did. I mean, I've, I've read that a number of times, but to hear him speak it, it sounds so, I don't know, it's very, very well written, very poetic, and very, you know, insightful um, about a particularly turbulent time within the, within the history of the United States. Um, and also a kind of, and a kind of uh, freshness to it too that I, that I appreciate. So I just want to make sure I comment on that before I started on my own um, spiel. Um, the, the, the project that, that Julian had seen um, was called, uh, or is called Drawings of Removal. I began on it in 1999, and, um, and it's an ongoing project. Um, I don't know if it'll ever be finished, but the, the catalyst for the work was a trip that I took with my father back to um, his hometown of, uh, of Galveston in Beaumont, which he hadn't been back to for more than 40 years. So the trip for him was a way of, of re-experiencing the past, but also um, for, uh, for it to be uh, relived with me. But um, upon visiting there, um, not only had the landscape changed, I mean, literally there were new streets, um, but his memories of the place had also, over time, had altered and changed. Um, it was throughout the experience of looking at certain landmarks that were um, important to him and became increasingly important to me um, that I realized that the memory of a place and its actual physicalness, these two things are very similar and that they can be mapped on top of each other. So this installation of images that you see here, this, this first uh, drawing on the left is called Inverted House, was the first um, location that we visited, which was um, the home that he grew up in. And when we turned the corner, um, when he went back to see his house, which was one of his few um, cherished memories, the only thing that remained was a grassy field and a tree stump. Um, after that, we went and visited the um, cemetery where uh, my great-grandmother, his grandmother, had raised him. And the only thing that he could remember to locate the grave was that there were cars passing by close on the, on the, on the highway. And he was 11 years old at the time. But we searched and searched and searched in the cemetery. And you know, for those of you who've, who've uh, spent some time in the South during the summer, um, you know, it would be quite humid, particularly after a crazy torrential rain. And this uh, cemetery was really beautiful. I mean, it was, the grass was completely overgrown. You know, it was like these, it looked like 100, 200 year old trees that were toppling over tombstones. Do you have any images of the cemetery? Um, just, just scroll forward, you'll, you'll find some. Um, and we searched and searched and searched, and we were never able to locate the grave. Um, later on, we went and visited what was then, at the time, the Texaco oil refinery, you know, the barbecue place that is one of the few things, one of the few people that actually remembered him. 
Um, and as I started to reflect on this experience of being there and thinking about um, not being able to find the grave, I thought, wouldn't it be this really wonderful metaphor to imagine all the roots of the trees stretching themselves out and wrapping around all the bodies, um, creating this underground system of relations that was completely invisible to us. Um, and then, as an idea, it was reinforced after you know going by the uh, uh, the oil refinery, which also was about you know complex system of underground networks, the extracting of organic matter um, into some other shape or form. Um, from there, this idea of understanding how connections could be drawn or understood, not just through straightforward lines, but that it could be more nodal, or it could be more associative, or it could be connected through um, you know syntagmatic or paradigmatic relationships um, or words that have similar or things that have similar attributes or characteristics can be as connected as simple cause and effect relationships. Um, and that I think over time has, has formed itself um, into the, the nexus of Julian and I's uh, methodological approach to looking at history. And I'll, and I'll, I'll make a segue to um, Cornelius which is, who's sitting here because Though Korn is a, is, a, is a musician, I'm a visual artist, and Julian is a writer, I do believe that what we have in common is this same approach to making, um, except the output is, is quite different, and hopefully our conversation will eventually talk about this, you know, some of the unique characteristics of this, of this way of seeing. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I would actually say that I'm, I'm like a, a, a slightly dumb, very structural, systematic thinker, and that you know our collaboration actually enables me to think a little bit more radically about my own practice. You know, it's it's very much by way of our conversation that that's happened. Um, and you know, so thinking about projects like drawings of removal, um, it seemed to me that the project of history and like determining what history might mean or what events that were um, how events. Uh, from the past are read and reread and gain meaning over time. They could be thought through the through the lens of uh, this this uh, the form of the buried um, through systems of, of creating systems of meaning through coincidence um, through, through making room in the process of history for erasure and interruption and dissonance. And, and also just to, to add to structurally what's going on there in the drawings is that these locations that that I have visited. I would draw them and redraw them, cut them out, and remove them, so that they were in constant states of becoming, either being built or coming apart. And the drawings were always made within the space of the when it was installed. Um, so there was a kind of a construction site feel to it that people were constantly asking me, "When is it going to be done?" Um, or um, "Should I come back when it's finished?" Uh, kind of experience. And I like that idea. That's I find that most exciting about places where you're not quite certain where it's going, but you know it's going someplace. Um, that kind of spirit. I think it's really akin to, um, I think that's sort of like the space where ideas come from. I think that's the space where great ideas come from. Maybe not all ideas, but I think that's the space where great ideas come from. And so this investigation, with these, with this, uh, that emer the investigation that emerged out of this collaboration was one, um, that began to engage a number of different places and ideas and uh, parts, of, parts of culture from Detroit, um, beginning from Heiser's Direct Mass project, but then moving very quickly and across time to um, other investigations. And we, were, we began thinking about the, the connections and disconnections between uh, Heiser's project and the urban uh, resistance of um, the, the 1960s and the defeat of that urban resistance, essentially. Um, one of the first things that we did on coming to Detroit was to go to the place, the location where um, those that uh, resistance began in 1967 um, on Rosa Parks and Claremont, um, and to think that space and to think that uh, uh, to think through that space. Um, and what what emerged was a network of of, of uh, a network or constellation of investigations. We became really interested in thinking through the registrations in music um, as well, um, and began thinking very seriously about underground resistance and in connection to these things. Um, underground resistance in Drexia, um, 
all of these things through a, a kind of uh, a, an analogy of the buried, the submerged, and the underground. And one of the things that I, um, I've, uh, I understand about the, uh, the way that um, demolition occurred after the riots, they had this, this uh, process of demolition had to happen very quickly. And so often buildings were not, um, uh, were rather than being removed um, from their uh, from their foundations, their, the structures were instead caved into the foundations and covered over with a layer of dirt. And so we had this imagining that the blind pig uh, where the riots began was actually still somewhere there, um, just out of view or covered over, or removed. Um, that the history of this place and the registration of these events was somehow uh, powerfully present there, um, but uh, just somehow um, submerged. Yeah. And this, this, this idea of drag mass, is this movement from the terrain to the subterranean, is kind of a, uh, a macro etching, you know, like a, drawing a, a needle across a metal plate. Um, that had a, you know, as an idea, you know, was out there, and then we had come across the, you know, this this basement where the where the riots began, and that but that the basement was partially buried, so it's still recessed just a little bit, but it's still there. Um, and then there's this strange monument, which to me is one of the most magical um, objects in the world. I, at the time, I had no idea who made it. I know we know who made it now. Um, but like the Heiser piece, I mean, it seemed the kind of an anti-memorial um, because, you know, uh, uh, um, polygonal geometry, from as far as I can tell, has no relationship to <laughs> revolutionary revolts, uh, as far as I know. But the thing just kind of sat there and it reminded me of the, uh, of the monolith from 2000. It sort of was a trigger of uh, some new uh, dawn, um, the, the evolution of, uh, of, of humanity, um, which was when I had become introduced to underground resistance and to Drexia, I realized that them as practitioners within the city or as musicians, that they were in a lot of ways an evolution of, you know, of, uh, of music or black music um, within within the United States, because like, I still don't completely understand why, you know, folks like Cornelius and Mad Mike decided that they wanted to start playing around with wavelengths and like crazy sounds and <coughs> things that felt real guttural and bodily, um, and then also submerging their own identities at the same time, uh, which is completely antithetical to what the trend was in hip hop, which is all about, you know, how big you are, how much you got, this kind of will to power, um, which one can justify, sort of, you know, like 50 Cent, you know, you can, you can justify um, becoming a hustler because the system put you in that place. It's a very convenient story, but that these guys went completely opposite. They were like, we're not trying to secede the street at all. Like, they completely went underground and created these new mythologies, these new stories about, you know, this kind of evolution of humanity into this, like, next stage. And I don't know if you want to jump in and add on to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, have, a, I have a question, a direct question. I mean, I, I, one, one way to begin the, this, or this engagement with, with your particular position and ideas would be to think out the, the relationship that we started to map out uh, in our conversations. And I wonder if you might want to talk a little bit about your reading of uh, this reference and the, what, it, what it meant. So what we have on screen is a, a, an image from the newspaper, from the Detroit Free Press, um, of the, uh, the 12th and Claremont uh, congregation. Um, um, and then you have the back cover of uh, UR's 1992 album, Revolution for Change. And it seems to me that revolution and change both need to be thought, right? Yes, uh, actually, um, I want to jump back for a quick second Absolutely. And, uh, and, and speak to some of what you were saying, Edgar, about uh, the, uh, the underground piece of it. And, you know, a lot of 
of uh, for folks who don't know, the underground resistance is a label, it's a group, it's a collective, it's a few different things. It was started by two individuals, uh, Mike Banks and Jeff Mills. Mike Banks was a musician, Jeff was a DJ on uh, WJLB at the time. And both of these guys have gone through some, some bad situations in their respective musical industries. Uh, Jeff was a victim of the uh, larger companies taking over a lot of stations at the time. Uh, there was a, a bit of a policy where there was a desire for no DJ to be more popular than the radio station uh, because of the fear of that DJ going to another station and taking the listeners. Therefore, uh, he was uh, targeted along with a lot of other DJs and uh, they told him that his problem was that he played hip hop and uh, had never been a problem up until this new thing came up. And so in his mix, he played some public enemy and they were like, fine, get out. And he was like, no, I quit. And that was the end of that, but he was a victim of that. Uh, on what, year, what year was that? This was, uh, I do not have the exact year, but I know it was the early 90s, maybe like 90, 90, 90. Um, or maybe just before, maybe in 89, but it was around that, okay. that time frame. Yeah. Uh, on the flip side, uh, Mike Banks was a musician, and uh, he'd had a rock band uh, known as The Mechanics. Uh, these guys, uh, like a lot of folks in Detroit, your dream is to be with Motown, to be able to say that you're a part of that famous label, the, the largest independent record label in music history in the world. Um, and it's from here, and so, you know, there's a certain uh, love for that label. Uh, they ended up getting signed by Motown, but after they were signed, uh, he was told that he had to get rid of the drummer in his band because his drummer was, and his skin was too dark. And light-skinned people were in, dark-skinned people were out. And, you know, the, the shock of, okay, wait a minute, this is Motown telling me that my drummer's too black. Uh, so uh, he, uh, he disbanded the group. Uh, that was the end of that group. And uh, so you've got a guy who had a real bad experience with, uh, with a large label. Uh, you have a guy who had a real bad experience with radio both areas where you know, these guys are, are based. And in it all was about the look and the profile and, and, and how, how widely you're known or seen or what your, the perception of power and that. So uh, out of that, these two guys came together and formed Underground Resistance. And, and uh, it was a, a group and a label devoted to the notion of being underground. Uh, the whole idea that, you know, it doesn't matter what a person looks like, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, what their skin color is, what matters is the music. And, uh, and that was actually Mike's uh, issue from the very start. Uh, his issue was, okay, I thought I was signed because of the music, not because of my, my skin tone. Uh, but, you know, that was the thing. It, it, was, it had nothing to do with his music. Uh, that was not the issue. Uh, the same thing for Jeff. Uh, the issue wasn't... Uh, even that was put out there, that had nothing to do with why he was removed from the station. It was all politics. So, uh, politics and business and BS. So, you know, you have these guys who, who really are coming from the standpoint of, okay, you know what, let's, let's not really worry about being, uh, having our face on things. Let's, let's be below the radar. Uh, and looking, you know, back at history, uh, any group that's made any kind of change or any individuals, a lot of people have made changes, have not been the public figures with the people behind the scenes. Um, you know, the easiest example I can pull from uh, is uh, Harriet Tubman, who is responsible for freeing, you know, you know, tons of slaves, but she did not advertise, uh, she did not promote herself, she did not, uh, you know, walk around and say, hey, here I am, come get with me. Uh, the only way she was able to achieve any kind of success was by being underground. And so, you know, being inspired by this and looking at this and seeing how how that works, and also looking at how historically, uh, you know, music and the arts have been the, the point of attack on a lot of different social levels. Um, and again, going back to, to slavery, uh, one of the first things that was outlawed was uh, the playing of drums uh, for fear of what might be communicated through those rhythms and those sounds. So it made a lot of sense to, to take that as inspiration and to go that route and to not be out in the open like that. Uh, and, and also to use the, the, the group and the label as a way of 
reimagining things and, and being able to recontextualize uh, events in history and the future, future history as I call it. So jumping to uh, this, this, this record here, this record here, uh, Riot, uh, one of the things that, that, that Jeff has said in the interviews, and, and I think uh, a lot of us, a lot of us within New York might agree is that you know the riots were such a a major turning point uh, here. I mean, and basically everything even to this day uh, here is defined by those riots. Um, that that situation is, has been a, something that's kind of followed us uh, again, you know, 30, 40 years after the fact. And um, I don't know if it's possible to be from the Detroit area that could not be affected by that in some kind of way. Uh, you know, we don't talk about it all the time, we don't uh, put it in the forefront of our minds, but uh, the city itself, I mean, you can drive around and see places that are still uh, destroyed from what happened back then. Places that folks didn't have the money or time or interest in tearing down, uh, that are just sitting there. And so... Can I, can I add something to that? Yeah. I, I mean, what's, one of the things that's really interesting to us uh, about this moment, though, is is the way that the, the nature of those uh, effects are not, uh, there's no consensus about the nature of those effects, essentially. Right. Um, and I, you know, this is coded into the very fabric of how people talk about them. Um, if you look at the official narratives, there's, uh, uh, which come from uh, the, the report by Cyrus Vance to Lyndon Johnson at the time, um, it's referred to as a civil disturbance. Um, uh, there's a conservative reading of them as a race riot, no matter how you take that to, how, uh, no matter how you take that to mean. Um, and then there's a leftist reading of the riots as um, someone like Grace Lee Boggs will refer to them as the Great Uprising. Um, and so, you know, the way that uh, each of these codings of the, the those events is, is uh, different. There's a kind of prismatic picture. Um, there's no consensus essentially about exactly how, what they meant, or how they meant for us now. So it's, everyone agrees that they're, that they made a, a huge change, or they did something serious, but no one agrees on what or how.
for uh, given that we're talking about pushing the music ahead of the individual. Um, the whole idea was that uh, you would never actually be able to see anybody's face clearly. Uh, the images would all be blurred out. Uh, you understand that there were, you know, of course, people making this music. But again, it wasn't important what they looked like or who they were. Uh, so there was a very conscious decision to make it certain that you never really could tell what the people looked like. Um, and again, that was a direct result of uh, the early experience that the uh, banks had had. Uh, in looking at the uh, riot, uh, yeah, Revolution for Change, which is uh, where all the stuff that comes from as well, the, I think one of the things about underground resistance is that uh, because of the music, because of, you know, I try to call it riot and things like that, there's this automatic assumption of militancy. Now, of course, you know, play played up on that, but again, it, it's all about going back to your come up, you know, our perceptions of what happened at that particular time in the 60s and what, what do you call it, what is it, what does it mean? You know, all of this stuff that, uh, you know, for, for, for these guys, I mean, it was like, you know, again, you're, you're influenced by what's happening. I mean, you can't, you can't escape it. You go down the street, you see it. You go to school, you see it. You pass by these buildings, you're around it. So, if you're going to talk about something that you know, uh, and, and also keep in mind that you know when techno kind of first started uh, in the early 80s, that was the same time that hip hop started, it was the same time house music started. All these musics came out at the same time. A lot of them had similar origins, just uh, different expressions in different cities. And so techno was, you know, from Detroit was very much about where you were from and, and what you were experiencing. Um, Dr. Dre was a was a techno before he became a rapper. Right? A lot of folks. Were. <laughs> Dr. Dre, Ice T. Uh, you know, a lot of these guys uh, have pulled from that. Um, you know, uh, you know, Missy Elliott. You know, got a Grammy based on Lon Atkins' track uh, uh, "Clear" from Cybertron. So, you know, there's uh, there was a lot of connection between these. Actually, I believe Ice T actually spent part of his uh, years growing up in Detroit. So that was a, a big influence on him when he did uh, techno music out in LA uh, before he switched over to hip hop in that sense of into rap. So, so again, I mean, it's it's all there, there was a lot of crossover. Uh, you know, you look at folks like Queen Latifah and the Jungle Brothers who did house music. It was no big deal. Uh, Africa Mbada was sampling craft work, but it wasn't like oh he's going techno or whatever. That was just what you do. And there wasn't as much separation. I think that uh, later on, when uh, these companies did step in and start uh, having more say in what happens and how it happens, uh, for marketing purposes, uh, I guess they'll say it was important to keep everyone separate. Um, and, and you see, you know, throughout history that uh, there have been a lot of great things that have been broken up and separated by people who have nothing to do with the, the scene itself. Uh, people who, for whatever other reasons, decide that they know better than the people who are involved in it. Um, but, but going back to that, though. Well, no, I, was, I wanted to say something about the, the nature of the music itself that I, that I thought was really fascinating, that when Julie and I were talking about, you know, we had saw a live performance of You Are, which I thought since we were in Detroit, it was, we saw the show, we just assumed that they performed every week and everybody here yeah. saw You Are all the time, but I had no idea it was one, one live performance. I don't know how many of you guys have done, but um, I never knew that you could perform techno live. You know, I just thought that you were just, you know, machines and you would tune, tune shit in and then, you know, that, that, that's the way that it is. Um, but aside from the point, that, that point, I think what's, what's unique about electronic music or its unique properties, which is different from um, an actual, like a, an acoustic instrument or, you know, a trumpet, um, is that there is no uh, separation between the music and its performance. So like every time you would play, you know, a UR CD, basically there was no translation. It just was. Like that's how they made it, that's how it sounds, that's it. And we've all had that experience where you go see a concert. Like I saw Willie Nelson in concert, don't ask me why. 
but I did. I don't like Willie Nelson, but he was great live. I got a CD at the end, and I put that sh I put that shit in the CD player, man. I threw it out the window before I got out of the parking lot. I was like, this sucks, but live it was awesome, you know. So like, there's some sort of um, there's a there's something which is lost or to be gained. Um, and um, I know it's funny. I didn't mean it to be funny, but it, it was. But you know, there's the, the point that I'm trying to make is that you know traditionally when we when we think about um, music, there's a uh, there's a kind of isomorphic relationship that we form between the sound and the instrument. Um, and with electronic music, the thing which is so radical about it, in, in my um, assessment, was that if a drum machine sounded like a drum, it was just simply a matter of coincidence or analogy. But it wasn't that a drum machine, even though it was called a drum machine was actually mimicking drums. Like what it was doing was producing a sound which was analogous to a drum, but that in itself it was a completely new thing altogether. Right? Yeah, I, have, I have something to say. Sorry, that's me um, I have something, I, I, I just want to like extrapolate a little bit what you're saying. Um, you, you know, a, a record is, is, even the very word record uh, says that a record documents the existence of person in the world, and there, there's a kind of association between like records as, as, as a, a, an index of, of presence, like someone was here, someone played, made this sound, and now what you're hearing by way of the record is that thing that happened in the past. I think, uh, you know, to build on what Edgar's saying, that you can actually see uh, techno records or electronic music records as working in a, in a sort of inverted way, um, that because they don't, uh, because they uh, they don't record a live performance as much as they um, they 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 take place in a, in a studio. They're like uh, that, that. What the records do is instead produce produce a reality um, rather than uh, document a reality. They produce something into the future. Every time it's played, it enacts the it enacts the music once once again. So they're not they're not artifacts. They're not records. They're like producers of the sonic world. And, and, to, and I wanted to, to connect that to um, back to Heiser because you know there's a I mean in philosophy you would call you would say that's invariance meaning like it doesn't it doesn't change I mean it's like it's even if its shape may be altered somehow like its nature is still in in, in essence the exact same thing um, and that um, and that Heiser um, actually believed that his dragged mass wasn't invariant meaning that it was a stone that was made up over you know hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years of history, and that it was a kind of a time capsule in a way. Um, but that it existed in a, in a time work, within a framework of time, which wasn't, you know, the time of the city, or the time of the individual, but this was geological time. And in, and in that framework, it sort of exists outside of politics, right? It's supposed to exist outside of metaphor, it's supposed to exist outside of analogy. Um, that in itself, you know, there's a, there's a certain ultimateness to it. Um, but as soon as he brought that slab of stone to Detroit, it immediately became allegory. Because this dragging of it across the, um, across the lawn uh, was read more as destruction than it was as um, that um, dispelling of illusions being, you know, the place where creation is. Um, and I sort of like to add to that point, it's, I mean, you know, they detonated it and blew it to bits um, to prove its invariance. Um, so so uh, I wonder if you want to talk about the exhibition uh, figurement. Um, is, is yeah, and, and how are we doing time-wise? I mean, I feel like we've been 20 minutes in the Q&A, or are we just, um, well, we, we, we just we over? Might, I think we have to make a choice, disfigurement. Oh yeah, I'll talk about it real quick. But also, I think that if you guys have stuff you want to say, you can just start screaming out. You don't even need to raise your hand, buddy. You can just start talking, just so you know. Well, I will. Um, I, I, I will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna cut me right off. <laughs> um, go ahead. Did you want to? Well, I just want. I want to hear more about uh, allegory. I, ah. I just want to know, like, yeah. when you use that word, yeah. uh, is it? Uh, first, we said the invariance trying to create something invariant, and obviously by breaking into a uh, social situation, it becomes an allegory. Yeah. So that would be, I'm just trying to figure out what ways you're using it, is it a positive or negative, all that? It's, it's, it's a very negative thing, um, in my reading. Um, 
not so much in the realm of objects, but I think it's a negative reading when it comes to the social fabric um, of a city or a community. Because what it does is that it renders people or individuals just simply as signs for a thing and rids them of their autonomy. So basically you just become a symbol of, you know, in Detroit that, you know, I, I think that, it, and also Watts is the same way, that, that there's a certain sort of allegorical reading of post-industrial cities is about like the height of, 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 the, of, of industrialism, both as like an apotheosis too, so like the failure of the promise. And the, the presence of ruins produces a certain uncanniness um, here within Detroit because normally when we experience ruins, we're struck by their beauty and awe because you're like, oh, look at that thing, it's, you know, society is gone, and, you know, but look at their buildings remain, it's incredible, it's a certain kind of sublime sentiment. But if the person who, you know, is still living around the corner when the building's burned up, you know, it's a little, you know, it kind of messes with, uh, with that kind of reading. So that allegory that came into play was completely antithetical to Heiser's intention, which he saw, you know, Detroit as any other city as a kind of monolith. And when he brought that slab here, it actually was the alien. Right? That's why that's why his connection to 2001 was so profound to me, um, because you know this thing just kind of dropped down out of nowhere, and um, you know 